Hi, everyone. Welcome. Let's, I'm just going to give a few more minutes for people to come in, but thanks for joining us today. Okay, I think I see we have a lot of people who are joining us. I think we'll get started. Um, I want to welcome you all for joining us today. Uh, my name is Brandy Cool. I'm the director of the Helen Crocker Russell Library at San Francisco Botanical Garden. And I'm happy to welcome you to Erin E. Hunter's Artist Reception. Uh, before we start, I'd like to encourage you to use the Q&A feature during the talk. Uh, we'll reserve time at the end to answer as many questions as we can. On beautiful, intricate, and enlightening, Erin's paintings are the perfect way to start a new year and restore the art exhibit program. If you can, please visit this exhibit in person. Uh, original paintings and prints are displayed in the library through April. Uh, currently, the library is open two days a week, Friday and Saturday, but I'm really happy to share that we will be opening the library more soon, and we'll be sharing those details within the coming weeks. So now, I'm happy to welcome Erin Hunter to speak with us about her new art exhibit, Wild Nectar, Paintings of Flora and Pollinators. Thank you for joining us, Erin. Thank you. I'm also um, happy to welcome Molly Lowry. Um, Molly is a longtime volunteer and docent for San Francisco Botanical Garden. And she has been the library art exhibit coordinator for over 20 years. Molly coordinates the art exhibit selection committee meetings. She communicates with artists, manages hanging and taking down of exhibits. And it's really quite a bit of work. And I'm grateful for her help and friendship over the years. Welcome, Molly. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Brandy. It is a, a little bit of work, but I really enjoy it. Um, well, these past few years have been unsettling and confusing for so many reasons, I'm sure you all agree. But at the library, we've had to postpone all the scheduled art exhibits twice. We're really, really happy that the first new art exhibit in two years is the work of Erin Hunter. Um, her artwork is not only beautiful and full of life and color, it is accurate and informative. It's perfect for our venue, really. I hope Erin agrees with that. <laughs> I think she will tell you about her experiences learning her craft in many parts of the country. I can tell you that Erin is not only a talented artist and a keen observer of the natural world, but she is also a pleasure to work with well-organized and flexible as we determined how to deal with the ever-shifting challenges of COVID. Helping Erin and her husband hang her artwork a couple of weeks ago in the library was easy and fun. It actually went quite fast. A glimpse for me that maybe someday soon we will be getting back to something like normal life. Recently, I was doing a little gardening and saw an unusual bee visiting a flower. You know, there are thousands of bees, did you know that? <laughs> I tried to get a closer look, but you know, they don't hold still. But I thought Erin could probably identify that. Anyway, I hope many of you will be able to see Erin's large three by three foot painting of California native bees and flowers titled Look Closer. It's an incredible piece of work. 
and you can see the original painting at the library at the Botanical Garden in Golden Gate Park. So let's hear from Erin Hunter joining us from her studio. Thank you. Thank you for such a lovely welcome from both of you. And um, I find, I mean, it's been very thrilling for me too. I was looking back through my emails today and looking back at um, my original email to you, Molly, and it was in March of 2019. <laughs> so this has been a long time coming and it's very exciting. Um, I, I'm so honored and thrilled to be um, showing artwork at a venue that is, I mean, the San Francisco Botanical Garden is, is just a really um, wonderful venue. It's such a gorgeous garden and the library is is like heaven for me. <laughs> it's full of all of the kinds of things I love to read. So it's it really is an ideal venue for me. Um, and I want to thank both you and Brandy too, Molly, for being really easy to work with. So um, it has been a bit of work to put it all together as every art exhibit is, but it's um, once it was all up, it was really thrilling to see it all come together. So um, I'm going to share my screen. I thought what I would do today, since um, you know we're not able to do this in person and a lot of people um, attending today may not be able to see the exhibit in person, I thought I would share some of the artwork that is in the show and additionally give a little bit of background about me, about my training um, and my education, some different work I've done along the way. Um, show some of the artwork and then um, at the end I'll show it um, the creation of that painting that big B painting look closer from start to finish because one of the things that people ask me about a lot is how I actually create a painting from start to finish so and hopefully you all can't hear the barking of my neighbor's dogs too much let's see here Let me find. It does stop. All right. Brandy, how is that looking on your end? Looking okay? Great. Okay. Yeah, it's good. So this is is the painting. Um, unmuted. There we go. Um, this is the the painting um, that was sort of the that has become the centerpiece of this show. Look closer. Um, this is a big painting. It's the biggest thing I've ever painted. It has uh, 40 different uh, California native bees, which is really just a small percentage of California's native bees. We have uh, about 1,600 species of native bee, um, and that's the sort of thing that I get very excited about. And I will um, share that I have always been the sort of person that gets excited about things like there being tons of native bees um, and wanting to tell people more about them. So um, with that, I will jump right in. Let's see. So I am a fine artist, but I'm also a science illustrator and an amateur naturalist. And all of these things dovetail together for me. Um, fine art is something that I, is, I've come to a little bit more recently. Um, I've been doing illustration full time for about 15 years now. Um, and before that, I was a graphic designer. And I think you'll see throughout um, the slideshow how maybe a graphic design background has influenced me. And I'm also an amateur naturalist. And what that means is I'm really interested in the relationships of the plants and animals that live around me in the ecosystems um, that I come into contact with, both here where I live and then elsewhere when I travel. Um, it's, I, I don't have formal training as a naturalist. I'm not a scientist by training. So everything that I learn is sort of by reading and by pestering people and by observing in nature. And observation is a theme that runs through all of my work. Um, another question that I get from people is, did you always want to be an artist? And while I don't know that I would have said, um, if you'd asked me as a kid, um, yes, when I grew up, I want to be an artist. I definitely was the sort of kid who was drawing all the time. Um, you can see, uh, like on, on the lower left there, that's uh, one of my dad's legal pads that I pilfered and drew all over. Um, and you can see multiple pages that I've drawn on. Um, and I mostly was uh, drawing animals as a kid. I was really into animals. Um, in fact, I, you know, the idea of becoming a vet <clears throat> was something that was of great interest to me as a kid. 
Um, interestingly, you probably are noticing that everybody is facing left in all of these drawings, and that becomes relevant later um, as a science illustrator when there are conventions for how you illustrate things. And typically, uh, everything is facing left and the light is always coming from the um, upper left. And I suppose that has something to do with most of us being right handed and wanting to draw the heads of things before we draw the rest of it. Um, but these are, you can see, um, I was always drawing all the time, and I was the usually the kid in class known for um, drawing, often getting in trouble for spacing out and uh, drawing or reading. Um, if you have looked at my website, you may have seen a little blurb about a, a book that I received as a kid, um, now missing its front cover, but this is the North American, um, the Reader's Digest Field Guide to North American Wildlife. And um, this is a book that I read cover to cover as a kid, and it's pretty big. Um, and I would check off all of the animals that I found um, in the area where we lived and um, would often try to mimic some of the drawings that I found in there. But this idea that I was, even as a kid, really interested in what lived around me and how to draw animals is something that will come up again later. Um, when I, it was time for me to go to college, I went to Chico State and I majored in graphic design. This is me at my graphic design portfolio review, so I'm 20 or 21 here. Um, I, as I was trying to choose majors, I was interested in a lot of things. I ended up minoring in Spanish because language is something that I am also very interested in. But um, the, the graphic design program really hooked me with typography. I found typography and this sort of organizing of information into a hierarchy where you could direct a, a viewer's eye from, from the most important thing and then on to the next thing. Um, I found that really interesting and um, the way that typography has evolved over the centuries and um, the way that you use color and, and a grid to organize things, all of that was very exciting for me. And um, having a graphic design background has proved to be uh, just incredibly useful as an adult um, in, in my, well, I guess I was an adult, but as, a, as an illustrator and particularly as a science illustrator, because a lot of the work that I do is information graphics. And so that having that background in how to create a hierarchy of information, how to organize things, how to combine text and pictures is something that comes up over and over again in my work. Um, after I went off to college, I worked my first job um, as a graphic designer for a small studio in Monterey, um, designing uh, view books and search pieces, search, search pieces and view books um, for colleges and universities. And I learned a ton in this job and I got to travel a lot. Um, and I, I did this for about two years. But one thing that came up pretty immediately for me was that I had majored in graphic design with the idea that someday I would start doing illustration. And I was really not doing any illustration at all in the two years I was in this job. And so after a couple of years, I was trying to figure out what I was doing. And um, my roommate from college wrote and said, well, if you want to come to New York, my roommate's going to be leaving. So um, I left Monterey and I moved to New York um, with no plan and not very much money. And uh, I lived there for two years. And while I was there, I just worked retail jobs and babysat and did little freelance jobs here and there. And I spent a lot of time with a sketchbook drawing people around the city. So I went from, um, as a kid, you know, observing things in nature around me to observing this sort of urban ecosystem of New York City. Um, while I was in New York, I one thing that I was starting to realize was as much as I wanted to be an illustrator, I really needed to um, develop my skills in drawing and painting. I, I had barely done any painting at all. And I was a pretty good draftsman. I was pretty good at drawing, but I did not have the skills necessary to um, be working full time. So I tried applying to several um, graduate programs. And I, the first year I applied to several and was rejected. And the second year I applied to several and was rejected. And the third year um, when I was still trying to figure out what I was doing, Doing, I found out about the science illustration program, which was then at um, uh, UC Santa Cruz and is now at CSU Monterey Bay. And that for me was like coming home. It was a, a group full of people who loved to draw things from nature. They loved detail. They loved reading nonfiction. 
they loved doing crossword puzzles. Everybody was really into um, learning more about nature all the time. Most of them had some kind of science background. Everybody was good at drawing. And um, even though I didn't have a science background, that thread of observation and paying close attention and being really excited about learning things paid off. Um, I submitted my portfolio and was able to get into the program. And I spent um, uh, nine months doing that program. And then afterwards, um, signed up to do three different internships. Um, and that year was just really a special time. And the my level of skill in drawing and painting was just catapulted forward, um, just partially because of the, the guidance of my teachers and my classmates, but also just the sheer volume of hours spent drawing and painting full time um, really honed my skills. Uh, after finishing that program, the first internship I did was at Cal Academy um, with a botanist named Tom Daniel. And he studies a group of uh, plants called Acanthaceae. Um, this particular plant right here is Luteridium mexicanum. It's a night blooming plant from Mexico and it attracts bats. So each of those flowers on the upper left fills up with um, nectar, which bats will come along and dunk their heads into. And the tops of their heads, the backs of their heads get dusted with pollen. Um, uh, and so that sort of thing was really fun for me. Working with a scientist who was really passionate about plants and getting to do illustrations for him was fun. However, I, ne I didn't get to work from live plants. This is the sort of thing that Tom would give me when he was ready for me to do an illustration. And as you can see, these are not live plants. Um, these are the sort of <clears throat> illustrations I was doing for Tom. These are black and white. They're about 11 by 14 pen and ink illustrations. And the idea is you take that flat herbarium specimen that you saw in the last slide and you turn it into something that looks alive and can be reproduced at size or smaller. And it shows all parts of the plants from the whole plant to the flower, to the seed capsule, to different kinds of leaves. If there are different kinds of, um, you know, if small leaves are bigger, better than, different than bigger leaves. Um, it shows seed capsules, any kinds of, th uh, this particular plant family has, um, has uh, little tiny hairs on the, on the leaves, that sort of detail I would include. Um, it was really interesting and exciting for me to be working with a scientist and working so closely with him because he would, I would turn in my initial drawings to him and they would come back covered with sticky notes with things that needed to be changed. And that sort of level of, um, Devotion to detail and accuracy is something that has stayed with me. Um, so these are two different um, botanical plates I did for Tom. After working at Cal Academy for, for a summer and staying in San Francisco, my classmate, Glenda Lee, now Glenda Mahoney, and I headed back east. Um, we, we stayed with some family members of mine and we interned at the Smithsonian in the entomology department. And the Smithsonian Natural History Museum is amazing, but also that where the scientists work is incredible too. Um, we were in the entomology section and there is an entire floor of just beetles. So we were on the beetle floor um, working with an entomologist, Dr. Alexander Konstantinov, who studies um, flea beetles, of which these are three. And the reason um, that he studies these are, these are major agricultural pests. If you grow tomatoes, um, you may have had trouble with um, flea beetles along the way. So our job was to do illustrations of these beetles to, um, to, have, uh, for, to help identify them for the USDA. And these beetles are tiny, so we were working under microscopes every day. And what you'll probably notice looking at these three beetles is that each of them is incomplete in a way. Either the, the legs are folded up or the head is tilted forward or it's, they're missing legs. And our job was to create an illustration um, that showed a, a symmetrical beetle with all of its parts and where you could see um, all parts of it. So the, the, um, the, the head and the eyes and the antenna and everything symmetrically and cleanly and in black and white so it could be reproduced easily. So these are the sorts of illustrations we created. These are about eight by 10 and they're pencil on coquille board, which is kind of a nubbly um, white paper that you can work on. Um, again, these beetles were super tiny and some of them, like the one on the upper right, um, I don't remember the name of it because we did several of these, 
But the one on the upper right was a holotype, which means it was the first specimen collected for when this species was discovered. And it was a specimen that was over 100 years old. And so when Dr. Konstantinov gave it to me, it was a little stressful <laughs> to be handling this tiny sesame seed sized specimen that was so precious and irreplaceable. I managed not to break it. I did break another specimen's leg off a few days later, which was absolutely terrifying for me. And it turned out to be okay. It was a very common species. In fact, it's the one catty corner to the um, polka dotted one that is, was the holotype. Um, but it just, it's one of those things where you're working with these specimens and you're, you just try your hardest to not break anything <laughs> and to create an accurate specimen. Um, as with working with Dr. Uh, with, with Tom Daniel, um, Dr. Konstantinov was uh, very persnickety about these illustrations. He himself is an artist and so was really, gave really excellent feedback um, for how to make things look more like the species that they were and how to, um, just little details to make them as accurate as possible so that working with him was just another level of again that sort of devotion to accuracy uh, after i did um wrapped up at the smithsonian i headed to san diego um, and at this point i um, was not really sure i wanted to do a third internship i was pretty tired um, I was ready to, I was getting ready to get married. I was ready to just kind of stop moving around all the time. I didn't have a place to stay. And I, my car at that point was not really going to make the trip to San Diego. So a friend, a college friend of mine, let me crash on her couch for eight weeks. And my parents let me borrow a car. And I drove down to San Diego. And I interned at Sally Ride Science doing um, illustrations for uh, supplemental science books for ages um, grades four to six and then six to eight. And I learned so much at this job. This was all, all digital stuff. I learned so much about um, each, each subject. I did every subject from the solar system to the, the planets down to uh, you know weather systems and um, biology and the water cycle. So each book I had to learn and all the science was at you know, this sort of middle grade, middle aged, not middle aged, middle grade, middle school aged um, level. And so easy for me to understand as well. Um, that internship turned into a job and I stayed there working remotely for six years. And I, I learned a ton at that job and it was um, really an amazing experience. And it was also cool to be able to say that Sally Ride was my boss. Um, when Sally passed away uh, a few years into my time working there, um, things changed at the company a little bit. And so my job ended up um, kind of going away. Um, however, I had already started um, doing a little bit of work on the side for a really interesting publisher, academic publisher named Annual Reviews. Um, my classmate, Glenda, the one I had worked with at the Smithsonian, um, had been working at Annual Reviews for a while. And um, I applied there. I thought their work was really interesting. And I um, ended up um, working there part time and then being taken on full time the year after that. So um, that was in I started working part time uh, as a temp there in 2013. And I still do most of my work for annual reviews as an illustration editor. Um, and that background, even though I don't have a science background and this is a very technical and very academic journal um, that sort of uh, attention to detail and working with scientists and being excited to learn new things has balanced out the fact that I, I don't have a science background. Um, and because we work with scientists um, to publish these articles and work with them on their illustrations, they're always very helpful with um, telling you when you need to fix something and make it correct. Uh, the one on the left is a bioscience or an animal biosciences illustration I did a few years back about tick-borne disease in African cattle. And the one on the right is a food science illustration um, talking about how the gut microbiota and the skin microbiota are, are related. Um, so this is the, um, the flip side or the, the other half of the kind of work I do. You know, I love to paint um, insects and bugs and things like that. But I also am really interested in doing this kind of work and feeling like I'm doing my bit to um, contribute to scientific knowledge. 
Um, along the way, I have done a few children's book illustration, a few children's books. These are books that I did for um, a, a company called Sylvan Dell. They're now called Arbordale and they're, they're back east. And they publish picture books about science and math. Um, and the reason that I was able to start working for them and illustrating children's books was a lifelong dream for me. Um, my work for Sally Ride Science um, was what, let, you know, when I submitted a portfolio to them, my work for Sally Ride Science is what um, showed them that I could um, illustrate an entire book, I could meet a deadline, I could carry um, a style through a whole book. So I ended up doing four of these and, and they were really um, a lot of fun um, and a ton of work. Each of these books from start to finish from my, my side of things took about nine months. Um, so they were a lot of work, a lot of fun, and I haven't done one in a little while, but I'd like to again in the future. So that's the sort of side of my work, um, the side of the um, com more commercial side of what I've done. And in the past few years, I've started exploring um, doing fine art for my own self, you know, sort of as a, um, a personal work side of things. And pollination has been the theme for me for, um, for all of this. Um, my another one of my classmates in the science illustration program introduced me, Erica Beyer, um, who's also a wonderful illustrator, introduced me to this excellent book, The Forgotten Pollinators. And as soon as I read this, I was totally hooked. Um, I find it so interesting. It discusses all of these amazing plant pollinator partnerships throughout the world, from the desert to, to the rainforest. Um, and I became totally obsessed because I'd always loved flowers. I became really interested in why flowers are shaped the way that they are and who are they trying to attract. So, you know, as opposed to cultivated flowers that we grow in our garden, wildflowers are always shaped a certain way to attract um, a plant or, or I'm sorry, to attract an animal because they're rooted in place and they need help getting their pollen from one organism to and uh, from one plant to another. So you call in an animal to help you do that. Well, how do you bring it in? You offer some kind of reward of nectar or pollen and the different ways that plants do this is so fascinating to me. So the um, piece on the left is um, of orange breasted sunbirds and pincushion protea. And that was the very first piece I did with pollination as, as the theme. I did that in graduate school um, and I became really interested in the idea of bird pollinated plants. So um, that was the first one I did. And, and the one on the right um, was maybe a few years later. Um, and that is a bottle brush that is cut from my parents' backyard but is actually native to Australia. And in Australia, in, in here in California, you know, it's visited by honeybees and hummingbirds and things like that. But in Australia, it's pollinated by these little honey eaters, which are similar to the African sunbirds you're seeing on the left there. Um, and, you know, our, our hummingbird pollinated plants tend to be very delicate because hummingbirds can hover and sit nectar. But in Africa and Australia, uh, where these two plants are from, um, the plants have to be a little bit sturdier so they can take the weight of a perching bird. Um, so you can see in comparison, these are a couple of California natives. Um, on the left, that is Justicia californica. That is one of the plants I illustrated for Tom Daniel at Cal Academy. And he had been doing this very interesting study on Costas hummingbird and migrating through and how that affected um, the uh, pollination and the seed set of Justicia californica, also known as Chuparosa. And I just thought that was so cool and I was so excited he was working on that, that I um, decided to do a full painting of it. And I use um, my original drawing that I did for Tom, I kind of reworked it and reused it. And the one on the right is Anna's hummingbird and hummingbird sage. And that's probably very, um, uh, very familiar to a lot of people um, on this call. But uh, you can see that the plants are much more delicate because they don't have to take the weight of a big perching bird. This is a, another African plant. This is um, Protea nerifolia, which is probably um, a lot of people are familiar with this one. And these are Malachite sunbirds. And I picked these two mostly because I thought that the color combination was really gorgeous. Um, and torch aloe, which is familiar to most Californians, especially if you live along the coast. 
They love um, our climate here. And these are scarlet chested sunbirds. So another kind of African bird, and you can see it perching on the, um, on the stem of the aloe there. Um, this plant is actually in my front yard. I dug it up from some friends um, and I kept having to, um, I wanted to draw the plant from life, uh, even though I couldn't draw the bird from life. So I um, cut the, I dug up the plant and then I cut the, the flower, but I kept having to go back and get new ones because it took me so, so long to paint this, um, that I kept having to go back and I was worried their neighbors were concerned that this person kept coming and stealing their aloe flowers every day. Um, along the way, um, my husband and I had gone to Alaska and we saw at, um, at Denali uh, National Parks Visitor Center that they had an art show there. And, and there was this thing called the National Park Service Artist in Residence Program. And I thought that sounded like the best vacation you could ever take. You could go hang out in nature and have some place to stay and draw the entire time and create a piece of artwork and turn it in at the end. So. Um, I applied for a few, and the first one that I got into was um, at Grand Canyon National Park on the North Rim. Uh, the North Rim of Grand Canyon gets a tenth of the visitors that the South Rim gets. It's also a very different ecosystem. It's not that sort of desert environment. It's, um, it's high ponderosa pine forest. It's like a, a really high plateau. I forget the elevation, but it's considered alpine, and they get snow. They have snow right now. Um, we arrived there, we had our, our little toddler, not quite two year old daughter with us, my husband and I, and we stayed in a cabin that was not very far away from the rim of the canyon. And it was absolutely wonderful. We went hiking every day. And then um, when the little one would go down for a nap, I would go out and draw wildflowers. Um, and this piece that I ended up creating for them was of this endemic thistle, Wheeler's thistle, and all of the the visitors that I saw coming to it. So moths, bees, butterflies, flower flies, and hummingbirds all visited this one. Um, a few years later, we went to Hot Springs National Park in Hot Springs, Arkansas. And that was a very different experience. Um, Hot Springs National Park is actually in the town of Hot Springs. It's a, a series of, of marble bathhouses that were built, um, I think in the 1800s, and some of them are still functional. Um, so that's the first part of the park, and then there's uh, the town of Hot Springs around it, and then there's a forested area that is also part of the national park around that. And the feeling there was so lush and green. We were there in the spring, and all of the plants that you see on that right hand painting there, they were all in bloom. And there were so many butterflies everywhere. It was just ast an astonishing amount of butterflies and all kinds of other bugs as well. Um, so we were there with a three year old and a six month old and, and to be like looking back on it, I think um, being in town and staying in a stone cabin at the end of it at the edge of a campground and being pretty close to town was actually pretty good setup for having a baby and a toddler with us. Uh, the most recent one that I did was in 2017 we went to Guadalupe mountains National Park in West Texas it's about an hour south of Carlsbad caverns um, and. This, this particular, you can see me on the left there sketching in the field. Um, and the thing about doing a, a, a piece like this where you're drawing plants um, from a national park is you can't cut any of these. You can't take any of the plants with you. And so all of the drawings that I did from of plants I had to do in the field or from photographs. Um, and all of the illustrations of the insects were done um, either from photos or using the um, the insect collection from the park. The park actually has um, their at the time their park manager was an entomologist, and so they had a really nice insect collection which they let me draw from. Um, as an aside, you'll see in the lower right hand corner of the painting there's a, a cactus there with a little bee over it. And that particular bee is a diadasia species, um, a little cactus bee. And I had been corresponding with a bee scientist throughout um, creating this painting because I wanted to, you know, what get his feeling about um, was I creating a painting that was accurate and showed the right species for the right flowers. And um, he was very clear that I needed to include this kind of bee. And I said, well, they don't, they don't have a species or they don't have a specimen of this at the park and he sort of grudgingly said well i'll mail you one so we went back home i en ended 
ended up having to finish this painting at home um, because it was a big piece and it took me a long time. And he did, he mailed me a bee, a bee specimen in the mail, packed very carefully. Um, it's still the coolest thing I've ever gotten in the mail. And um, I ended up uh, finishing this and then mailing the bee back to Guadalupe Mountains National Park and they have it now in their insect collection. Um, during the, the process of uh, starting to work on personal work that was focused on pollinators, I started thinking about creating work that was less straight science illustration and more fine art. Um, and I think you probably start to see that a little bit in my um, pieces that I did for the national parks. But I also wanted to start creating pieces just for myself that had a little bit more of my point of view as an artist. Um, so one thing that I had been interested in painting for a while was a collection of hummingbird flowers from Monterey County, where I live, and some of our local species of hummingbird. And I wanted to do something, do a layout that was a little bit more, um, a little bit less straight illustration and something that had more of a, a motif or um, a design to it that was more unusual. Uh, unusual. So uh, this piece is called Floral Compass. And this piece took me about um, seven years to work on um, from start to finish, from when I did my initial sketches of all of these plants, which I mostly tried to do uh, when they were from life, um, when they were blooming, um, to the final piece, um, the final painting. It took me about seven years. And in that time, I you know changed jobs. I had two kids. I um, uh, you know, a lot, you know, just underwent a lot of changes, but I was always working on this in the background. Um, the design of this piece is, and you'll see throughout my portfolio, I, I keep coming back to circles. I love circles. Um, people often look at this and ask me if it's a mandala, and maybe, maybe it is in its way, but it's actually based on a um, stained glass window um, of which my husband and I have seen a lot in our, in our travels. Um, so this particular piece is all um, plants that I see here in, Mon in Monterey County and um, the hummingbirds that go with it. Um, so a lot of people will ask me, how does a painting begin? So going back to this painting here, when I say I worked on it for seven years, you know, starting with sketches and then, you know, I worked on it um, over time and then eventually I finished this painting. What does that actually mean? How do you start a painting? How do you get the idea for a painting? Um, and so I'll, I'm going to show you from start to finish how I created the next painting in this series of plants pollinator relationships um, look closer, which is the centerpiece of this show. So this particular piece, Floral Compass, um, uh, features hummingbirds and hummingbird flowers. And once I finished this one, I, I had been thinking about what I would do for my next piece, and I wanted it to feature bees. I had been researching bees for a while. And what I had learned was, again, there are 1600 species of native bee in California. And I thought that was so wild that we have so many kinds of bees and yet most people don't. I mean, I didn't know this and this is my whole jam. Pollination is my thing. And how did I not even know this? Um, so I started researching bees and um, I tend to make friends with bee people. <laughs> I research online. I look at bugguide.com. I look at other places and I see who's taking pictures of things and I email them and ask for help. Or I will find bee scientists at universities and email them. Um, so I just started drawing bees and in the back of my mind, I was sort of pondering how I could make a, a layout and a piece that would be sort of analogous to that hummingbird piece, but also its own thing. So I would work on these bee sketches and kind of think about it and, and try to figure out what, um, how I was going to organize it. And then um, I started drawing bee flowers as well. I did choose some, like I didn't choose maybe the workhorses of the bee nectar, bee pollen plants. I did choose some more um, showstopper plants than uh, in my final painting, but um, drawing the plants was something I was mostly able to do from life. Um, so as I'm thinking of, I'm working on these sketches and I'm thinking, how am I gonna put this layout together? How am I gonna organize it? Um, and my daughter came home from preschool with this drawing on the left. Um, she was going to a Montessori preschool and they do this thing called metal insets where they will take a metal um, uh, stencil and they'll put it down and they'll trace the inside and then they'll rotate it and trace it again and make a tessellation. 
So she had made this tessellation of triangles and brought it home. And I thought, oh, that's very interesting. So as you can see on the right, I started playing around with um, hexagonal shapes, thinking about honeycomb having this hexagonal interlocking design and thinking about ways that I could also sort of tessellate it and then have each of those little windows be something I could tuck a, a plant in and then that would kind of call back to the hummingbird piece. And this was the layout I, I came up with. You can see in the background um, that digital design. I did that in Illustrator. And then you can see all of my plant drawings on top of it. Um, and this is quite a rough sketch. Um, most of these drawings, I believe what I did with these is I think I scanned them in and clipped them out and placed them in Photoshop. But sometimes I'll do that with um, tape and pencil, or I'm sorry, tape and um, photocopies. Um, and then for the bees, I did the same thing. I took scans of my drawings, clipped them out, and each of them was on a different layer. And this allowed me to size things accurately because I wanted each of the, I knew that the bees and the flowers needed to be um, accurately sized. Um, and I wanted everything to be three sizes larger than life so that you could really see the detail of these bees because some of them are only maybe four millimeters long. Once this was all organized, I started transferring it to watercolor paper, which was um, sized and then taped down to masonite. You can see me working on it on the left there. And the way that I transferred this was just an old fashioned piece of graphite paper, similar to an old credit card receipt that you would sign, um, like a carbon copy. So it's just carbon paper. And so I traced the entire thing onto watercolor paper. Um, and you can see on the right there, I'm blocking everything in with thin washes of color. Um, I paint in acrylic, but my first few layers are, are really thinned down with just water to make it thin uh, and washy like a watercolor. And here you can see I'm blocking in the color. So what that means is on the top row, you'll see that there are just um, flat, thin washes of color on everything. And this sort of helps me figure out where, it sort of helps me map out the color and which areas are going to be, um, uh, which areas are gonna be lighter, which are gonna be darker and that sort of thing. And then on the bottom row, you can see that once that initial layer has been added of, um, the initial layer of color has been added. Then I start adding detail with smaller brushes and thicker paint, so less, um, less water and more actual paint. This is just a close up so that you can see the detail on one of the bees and one of the um, plants that's tansy leaf facelia. And I forget which bee that is because <laughs> I did so many of them. I did 40, 41 altogether. And on the right, you can see that little teeny tiny bee is so small that I, I'm using a, um, a, uh, a magnifying kind of light to look under it um, to be able to see, to see what I'm doing. This is uh, me working in my office studio thing, so you can get a sense of how big the painting is. It is an absolute miracle that I didn't spill anything on this painting. And while I was working on it, I wouldn't even bring anything uh, I, the only beverage I would bring in here was water. I was so worried about getting it dirty. It's a miracle I, I didn't spill anything on it. Um, and here is the final piece. So you can see um, that original hexagonal design and um, all of the bee flowers. And again, some of these flowers like that bright yellow flannel bush center left, um, the big five petaled yellow flower it might not be like the plant bringing the most bees in, providing the most food for bees, but it's such a gorgeous flower that I couldn't help but want to include that one. Um, and these are just a couple of pieces I'm working on right now. The one on the left, I, I have this um, series that I'm working on right now, these sort of spectrum based um, wildflower pieces, each with a pollinator. So there's red on the left and orange on the right. I'm working on yellow next. And that was inspired by all of these field guides that I have that organize them um, wildflowers by color. So um, I've been talking nonstop and I am sure that um, uh, I could answer questions if anybody has any. Um, and so I can keep this up, Brandy, or I can um, stop sharing whatever works for you. No, why don't you keep that up? Okay. Okay, let me see. Well, uh, first, I just want to thank you. 
very much um, for your My presentation pleasure. and joining us today. And your passion and your talent are just really remarkable. And we're honored to have your beautiful paintings in the library. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so feel free to use the Q&A feature now. And we did have a question that came in earlier from Brene. And um, the question is, did you, what medium did you use for your flower and bird illustrations? That was painted in acrylic on watercolor paper. Um, <clears throat> acrylic has become my go-to medium. And I like to paint on watercolor paper, although I'm interested in, in starting to paint on wood panel as well. But um, acrylic can behave like watercolor if you thin it down, but it also can go opaque and it dries super fast. And because I live in an area that gets quite foggy, um, sometimes watercolor can take a while to dry. And it's really handy to have um, the ability for it to dry really quickly and the ability to paint over things in that opaque medium of acrylic when you have made a mistake, which 100% of the time I do. Particularly when I was working on those children's books and I was doing big pieces and they, I had a deadline being able to work in acrylic and know that it would dry right away um, worked really well. And in researching acrylic, it, it was developed for commercial artists. And I understand why, because when you have a deadline, you need it, unlike oil or watercolor, it will dry quickly and you can keep, you can work as fast as you need to. Thanks. Um, so Nicole asked, which piece is your favorite? Do you have a favorite or is it too hard to choose? <laughs> I think it's usually the thing that I have completed most recently because like uh, the most recent one I've done is the wildflowers in orange because I think each piece I get a, a little bit better and I figure out the problems of um, of previous pieces and so my skill level is just a little bit better with each one so you know in terms of like um technically speaking I always like the one that I have done most recently in terms of um, being emotionally attached to them, um, I think the big Protea nerifolia piece with the um, the malachite sunbirds that one just kind of flowed when I was working on it, and like every almost everything, like all the paint strokes went where I wanted them to, and it just was easy, and I was um, really happy with how it came out. So that one I, I'm I'm always attached to. Uh, okay, so Ella, age nine, is curious if you still use a microscope for details. I do. Hi, Ella. Um, I do use, I use a bunch of different things. I have, um, I have a magnifying light. Um, I have, uh, I will sometimes borrow microscopes from a friend who is a high school science teacher. I use a handheld magnifying glass. I use a field loop um, when I'm working out in the drawing out on the field. Um, so yeah, I use all of those things. Or sometimes what I'll do too, if I just as like a really quick way to do something, I'll take a picture of it and zoom it way in. And sometimes that will kind of do the same, um, have the same uh, effect as using a magnifying glass if I have forgotten it and I'm out in the field or something. Um, so Stacy has an interesting question. Um, they want to know, what is one of the most unusual happenings you've witnessed while doing field work during your national park internship? Oh man, that, I mean, I think that my timing has always just been, I've really lucked out with my timing on all of them. And so, for example, when we were at Grand Canyon, we happened to be there right after a monsoon. And so the, the, the meadows of wildflowers just erupted. And then like right after that, there was a huge hatching of like butterflies, bees, um, flower fly, all of these insects came out. And so it just, the sort of abundance of flowers and insects was really, um, really amazing while we were there. Um, when we were in hot springs, I don't know what we did in terms of timing, but there were just butterflies everywhere. And I remember being like, we were in a Walmart parking lot and there were swallowtails everywhere. And I was like, is <laughs> it was like being in a, um, I don't know, it was just really astonishing being there. Um, 
And then in Guadalupe Mountains, I feel like we just really lucked out on seeing like um, birds that I had never seen before, like all of these beautiful tanagers and and things like that. I will say the craziest thing that has happened is um, when I went to Grand Canyon, the person who originally was going to be my um, my contact there left and did not tell me she was leaving. And then the person who replaced her was kind of doing two jobs. And when I got the, she said, you'll meet the new person when you get here. And so we showed up, we drove from our house all the way to Grand Canyon in our car. And so when we showed up, we were just like, well, I hope this works out. And it turned out my contact there was somebody that I had gone to elementary school and junior high with, but I hadn't seen in like, you know, however many, at least 20, 25 years, because I moved my senior year of high school and lost, you know, had not seen anybody from, from there, except for maybe one or two people. So for her to be my contact there was felt very otherworldly. <laughs> You and your family must have some pretty amazing memories from all your travels. <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty cool way to vacation. If you have a partner who's willing to, you know, to go with you. And uh, I have all these great pictures of my husband with like a kid strapped to a sleeping kid strapped to his back. And he's trying to take a picture of a very small plant and without the kids sliding out of the backpack, you know, so. Um, but it was a, it, it's been a pretty cool way to see the world. Well, we have several more questions, so I'll just keep going here. Um, Marley would like to know what brands of acrylic you use. Oh, I use Golden, or not, I'm sorry, not Golden. I use, I have them right here. And hi, Marley. Um, I use Liquitex, and I'm extremely not particular about them. I have some that are like this I bought. Um, this is from Ellis Art Supply in Chico. So I bought this when I was in college and you can see it's almost empty, but there's still a little in there. Um, but I'm not very, I, I buy Liquitex because I'm used to their color palette. Um, and I, I, I like them, but I don't do anything special to them. I don't add medium. I don't do any of that. I just kind of thin them out with water and paint that way. Um. So Linda would like to know, have you painted any monarch butterflies in Monterey County? I have, oops, I have painted monarchs for one of the children's books that I did. Um, and I've painted um, just sort of like a, you know, some portraits of butterflies just on white, just sort of like that traditional looking kind of pinned specimen with their wings out like this of monarchs and other butterflies. Um, and I've painted big groups of butterflies for um, one of the children's books that I did for a book called Multiply on the Fly. Um, and that one was a lot of fun to, to paint. I would like to do something more with monarchs. I haven't quite figured it out yet, but um, having finished that bee painting, I'm going to tackle moths next for my next big sort of pollinator piece. And then I would like to do something with um, butterflies as well. And addressing how some of them are migratory, which I think is just crazy. I can't believe that a monarch or a painted lady butterfly or some of the other butterflies, something that fragile is able to migrate and then la like land and continue, you know, stay alive longer. That just seems so, um, just so remarkable to me and so it, unlikely, I guess. So I, I'm really interested in that. and the migration of migrating um, insects and in particular butterflies because they seem so delicate and yet they they do this huge thing so um, I haven't quite organized how I would put that together but that's on the docket. Well, um, so Colin would like to know whether any species or flora in the big bee painting look closer that you wish you could have included but you just didn't have the space. Yeah, there were a few. They, there were. Um, we have a really cool local thistle called a cobweb thistle, and uh, it's sort of got this gray foliage and then this shocking pink thistly flower. But um, I will include that one in my butterfly painting because butterflies love that one. I'll find a way. I'll find. I always find a way to squeeze in the favorites. Uh, Marley would like to know. 
Do your children share your love of drawing? Oh, yes, they do. They are, in fact, one of them, um, we went and had a parent-teacher conference and my older child, who's a second grader, um, we heard from her teacher that she often has a hard time coming back to, like kind of coming back to earth after sitting and drawing for a while. And the younger one too, but particularly the older one. And sometimes um, her teacher catches her reading under her desk, which is something I was, I got busted for a lot as a kid. So they definitely love, um, they love to draw, they draw all the time. And that's partially just because that's what I have. I That's what I have in my bag. I always have paper and there's usually some colored pencils rolling, rolling around in my purse. And so, you know, when we're like waiting for coffee or we're at the doctor's office or whatever, that's what we do is we have, um, you know, little pads of paper and, and drawing and they, and I just have so many art supplies too, <laughs> that they're, they're just always around, they're always out. And so I think part of, part of it is they, they like to draw just be, you know, they naturally like to draw and part of it is the availability of materials. <laughs> They're just always out. Seems like a really nice way to interpret or you know, document what's happening around you. And I loved seeing those um, sketches you did in New York City. That was very cool. Thank you. So we have another question. Uh, did you use brushes to get those very fine lines or do you use acrylic pens? I use, I can show you what I use. Um, my brother Andrew got me these Copic pens a few years ago. They're, um, they come in different sizes. So one of them is almost like a, a calligraphy pen, but some of them are so, so tiny. Like this one is 0.05 millimeters. So it's super duper tiny. And I don't know how well you can see that, but it's really, really small. And this is what I use for like leg hairs on bees <laughs> or antenna or things like that where I there's something about even after doing as much painting as I've done I've just logged in a lot more time drawing than I have painting and so sometimes if it's a little tiny fiddly detail I will switch to something where I'm holding a pen or I'll use a mechanical pencil for for detail work or to kind of like clean up a line because I I sort of trust myself a little bit better holding a pen um not always but like for little teeny tiny detail I'll do that and then sometimes if I screw it up then I come in with an exacto blade and I'll just kind of like carve out the offending section and redo it thank you um so Wilbur would like to know how do you handle revisiting species that bloom only for a short period of time at varying times of the year um photos that's the main that's the main thing so and that's how I mean for example, all of the um, all of the species of birds that are African or um, Australian, I don't have access to to even specimens of those. I don't have, let alone a live bird. Um, so all of those are are being done from photos. So the trick is to find a lot of photos and to um, and to get different view views of things if I can. So with um, with flowers, what I'll do is if I can draw them in season or if I can draw them when they're blooming, I'll just do a drawing and I'll take photos for color or I'll do like little color um, color studies to try and get as much information as I can. Um, but for some things like um, bee specimens, you know, a lot of times you can't, you know, if you're looking at a bee specimen, say at Guadalupe Bay Mountains National Park, you can't take those specimens with you. You can't even take them out of the building. So you have to sit and draw them there. So I just um, either with photos or specimens or whatever, I do draw really detailed drawings with notes and color swatches and photos just to get as much information as I can. And then I just have to trust that I got enough information there. Um, I will say that again, I will I email people all the time and ask them if I can use their photos. Um, if there's a a species that I'm interested in, but I can't find photos, I'll ask them to share with me. And people are always really cool about it. Um, so, you know, for example, if I'm looking for a photo specifically of a bee in flight or a bee going into a flower or whatever, I can, I'll email somebody and say, I notice you take a lot of pictures of this. Do you, do you have one of this particular thing? And people are always really accommodating. Thank you. 
And we have one more question, which I think will round out our event very nicely, is um, do you sell prints of your artwork? And I can answer that a tiny bit, is that all of the pieces in the exhibit in the library are for sale or most. And we do also have prints that are available in the library too. But I think Erin also has also sells prints of her pieces too. I'll let her. I'll let you answer that. Yes, actually, this can be. I can show you my last slide, which has um, the different ways you can check out to see what I'm doing. And the the one on the bottom there is my Etsy site where I sell prints and note cards and things. Um, I am at some point. I'm, I'll probably move things over to my website. I'm working with a web designer to redo my website right now, um, but for right now, Etsy is the place to find those things. And then um, Aaron Hunter Art, which is my Instagram, is where you can see works in progress. I'm sharing a piece every day of um, the pieces that are in this show, um, and then my website has like a little bio and things like that. But prints and note cards um, can be, you can find those on Etsy. All right. Well, thank you. So much, Erin. Thank you, Molly. Uh, I just wanted to say that. thank you so much to Erin. Sorry to interrupt you, Brandy, but um, but that was fantastic. I really oh, I've seen you. so many Zoom presentations <laughs> the last few years. I can tell you that was wonderful. It was really great. And I I I just want to say Wilbur, the last questioner. I believe is Wilbur Wong who's going to be our um, exhibit starting in May. Um, he does amazing pictures, photographs of high altitude water lilies in <gasps> Yellowstone. <laughs> so it's a very, very beautiful and completely different exhibit from Erin. So I think everyone should look forward to that. And everyone, if you can go to the Botanical Garden and see the paintings in person uh, right now of Erin's because the botanical garden looks great. All the magnolias are out, but also um, you can see the original works, which is really special. Well, and thank you for for you know hosting this, and this this has been really fun. I mean, it's always very easy to talk about the things that I find interesting. So it was great to um, have a venue to do that in, and and especially one as well respected as the botanical garden. So I'm feeling very uh, lucky today. We are too. Well, and I'm glad Molly, you mentioned the magnolias because they are just about to bloom and it's really just a really magical time at the garden. So I hope everyone uh, can visit and we hope to see you in the garden and in the library soon. So thank you so much everyone for joining us today. Bye. Bye. <laughs>